Hi everyone, if you're just coming in, please take a seat. Um, my name is Angela, this is my first time hosting uh, Digital Wednesday. Uh, this is a special edition tonight uh, for, digital, for Dutch Design Week. Um, the whole program will be in English, which is also a little bit different from what we are used to uh, normally, but we have four uh, amazing speakers coming to talk to us about uh, a type of design that's uh, proving to be hard to pronounce. So raise your hands if you think it's pronounced generative design. Okay, okay. And raise your hands if you think it's generative design. So I guess they win. <laughs> okay, we had a discussion about it at dinner. Um, we have four speakers here. It's quite a niche, um, but I heard uh, that it's very big uh, within certain uh, groups. Um, so there's even a live stream. I heard there's people joining from San Francisco. So please wave to everybody in San Francisco. Hi. <laughs> there they are. Um, Digital Wednesday, for the people who are new, uh, is an event that we host every last Wednesday of the month. Uh, we have different topics every month. Um, this time it's about generative design. Uh, we also have the live stream. And the first speaker tonight is going to be Patrick. Uh, Patrick is joining us from uh, Germany. Um, he is actually uh, very brave, I think, because he quit his job last year to focus completely on generative design. It's something that he's always been doing uh, ever since he was young um, and he wanted to explore it and he found himself when he came home at night that he wanted to keep uh, going with uh, generative design, put his uh, work laptop away and a year ago he said, okay, I'm actually going to stop my regular job and uh, make uh, my living, see if I can make a living out of generative design. Uh, and tonight he's the first uh, one who is going to hopefully uh, make it a little bit more tangible for you so we can learn a little bit about what he thinks uh, generative design is. So everybody, please put your hands together for Patrick. So yeah, thanks. Uh, bear with me. I didn't expect such a crowd, so I'm somewhat nervous, but you all seem like nice people, so I'll get through this. Um, so I want to talk to you about uh, Brave New World, generative design, um, and my take on creative algorithms and um, some strategies that I use within that work. So indeed, I've been using it for the past year um, like as a full-time experience um, and as an addition to my work as a designer. And the first thing I really want to talk about to you guys is why you should actually care about generative design, or at least why I believe you should. Um, it's in really open field, and everything we talked about um, prior to this talk is that is such a like vast space. There are many answers to this, and I'm just going to guide you a little bit through how I work with it and how I believe um, it can be applied, actually. So I struggle um, with this question a lot of what it is, but I believe I have one answer, and it is so generative design is something that allows you to build new forms of communication. And I think that's a really abstract definition, but it's one that's really true because it touches on many fields and on many forms of how you can actually apply this. And maybe in other words, for me personally, it's something that allows me to tell new and fresh and meaningful stories. So as a designer, I always look to um, find new, um, to find new things um, that I want to communicate and to really reach people in a different way. And um, in some way, generative design, I'm going to go through a couple of steps that make this kind of possible, is something that really allows you to do that. Um, before I go into this, I want to just mention one thing that to me personally is really important, and that is that design at its very core is really about people. So when you hear talk about generative design, um, it's a lot about algorithms, about software, using that framework or this approach or, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it is totally important for making it happen. But I think if you um, stick true to the definition I gave you of my personal view of generative design, it's that it's always about people and stories in some way. And the other stuff is kind of a tool for it. So what I believe is um, something that is really strong, why you should care, is that it really um, fosters various aspects of communication, especially engagement, interaction, exploration, and insight. I could probably spend like the next 20 minutes just on this slide giving you various examples of why that is pretty cool. But for now, just believe me that there are so many new things that you can do with this where you actually um, really get people to interact and engage with your work. So what for me it means really is that you can bring these stories that you design or whatever you want to tell really to the people and um, create something where, where they can experience it, where they can play with it, and where they can actually be, and I think that is one of the coolest aspects of it, really be at eye level. 
at what you do. Uh, I've said I'm a designer, I have a background in um, working as a creative director for large brands and um, agencies, and it was always a bit about, okay, let's build this thing on a focus group and um, design it in a way and then put it out there and, and see how people react, and we do tests, A, B, multivariate, all that kind of stuff to get the metrics, and we scan it, we change it, and then we put it out there again. And that's like a cycle that doesn't really respect people in, in that sense, that they should be really part of the conversation. Again, I'm just saying that from my personal point of view. But really, if you build the space and if you give them um, a reason to be part of this story, um, really the way you do communication and design and storytelling really changes. So, and maybe as one sentence why you should also care is that I believe that it really creates these new and emerging opportunities for use designers, for creatives, for entrepreneurs, or for whatever you are. If you are in some way talking to people, telling stories, or building stuff that, that makes sense, then this should at least be something you consider in your workflow in some way. I want to give you a quick philosophical interlude, um, just because um, it, it makes the point a bit more clear. I was actually sitting down with a friend when I prepared for this talk, and I um, tried to explain him what generative design is, because people always ask that, right? What do you do? What is it? And there's not this one sentence, unless it's as cryptic as the first one that I greeted you with. So we talked about it and I explained it to him and he said one super cool sentence because he's totally into books and like questioning the fabric of everything, which probably would also make for a good designer. And he said, um, it reminded him of a sentence, I don't know if he made, him up, uh, made it up or if he found it somewhere, he said, when you want a new world, you need new words. And I felt that strongly resonated with something um, that I've been um, thinking about a lot and that is that really generative design is something that allows you to free yourself from existing words and that idea, but from existing tools in another way. So basically, use Photoshop and Illustrator, InDesign, all these tools that are built for something specific, but that don't integrate this um, component of really making something that is available to the end user in real time, in, in physical space, wherever. It's a tool built for more like a classical way of design. So really, that is something that I want to tell you. You should care about this stuff because you can build your own tools that tell the stories you really want to tell. So it, I know it sounds like a motivational speech right now, but I think we're going to be having so many um, other awesome speakers today really showing you the various facets. And I'm going to show you something more than just uh, black ink on a, on a white screen, but um, still, I think it, it really sets the stage for what these guys are going to show you. And again, I think everybody of these guys is, is really doing this. And they're building their own tools to make their own stories and to interact with you in an interesting way. And you do that with programming, which for me is a tool that extends your creative toolkit. Um, so it's like a paintbrush in some way. Again, I'm just saying that because so many people feel that programming is already the thing you do this with in a sense that if I do that, I'm going to be good. But it's just a tool. If you, if you know how to use your paintbrush, you only have like half of the equation in some way, right? You still got to be creative and, and do these things. So just saying that if anybody of you is really interested in pushing this further, don't get distracted too much by technology initially. For me as a designer, as a creative person, it is a fundamentally freeing and expressive technique of, of creativity. It is something that really allows you to um, yeah, find new answers to new questions. So to reiterate, talked a lot, um, generative design really allows you to tell fresh and meaningful stories. And I want to give you a basic idea um, of how I think you can go about doing that and how you can make sense of it in some way. But before I do that, um, I just want to briefly mention this handsome guy over there who's going to be giving the next uh, talk after me, uh, with whom uh, definitely um, the credit goes to uh, as well for like, finding this strategy and this approach. We've been working together for over five years now, I guess, um, exploring these ideas. We're taking different routes now, um, Tim and I. Uh, he's more teaching people now. I'm doing it more on the commercial side of things. But still, you know, we've thought and talked about you know, what it is that we do almost every day. Let me take count of the time. Oh, my god. So um, when we looked at all this stuff and all these works, initially from other people, then from us, and we, we talked about this, we found that there's a common pattern to this kind of stuff that we experience and why we believe that it's interesting. And we found a really simple formula that seems so simple that it's almost trivial, but I think that's true for most good ideas in some way. And we just defined the pattern of almost all generative work we found in some way as something that follows the input-output pattern. And what that really means, if you visualize it in some way, is that if you have like various 
you know, media, music, sound, text, big data, you just plug it into a different output, it becomes something new. So what we, what could also be a definition of what generative design is for us is we transform media from one medium into another one. And in the process, tell new stories and find new interesting things hidden within. So big data could become a sculpture, or maybe music or sound could create architecture. I'm actually currently right now working on a project um, where people can record sound and create like three-dimensional architecture to play around with, and it's going to be a comment on some stuff, doesn't really matter. Or you could just take like a more traditional approach and use a newsfeed to drive like a data visualization, or maybe you could use text to actually design a book cover. So if you look at this input-output model, um, I'm just going to quickly run you through it once, because this is something I actually pitched as a, as a business idea in some way. I actually take text of a book, now look at these various like adjectives and textural properties and all that kind of stuff, right? That's hidden within that. And I like kind of put it into this blender, which in this case stands a bit for um, like the algorithm or the process that I'm trying to drive. It's like super simplified, but it's kind of how it works really. And I just get something new out of it. So I transformed this text into actually a book cover. And you know how that exactly works, I don't really have time to go into because I'm talking longer than I expected, but in the end that's I think a really simple example of how many variations you can generate if you just like follow this basic pattern. You take something, put it through a process or an idea, and you create something new, and that makes interesting stories. We actually put together a really big list of possibilities, and um, this is basically really, really part of our creative model on this kind of stuff where we had this joke that if we just took like two darts and just went through one to the left and went through the right, we would come up with a new idea. And it is actually true. I've found so many ideas uh, hidden within this basic list of stuff. And obviously, yeah, I'm not going to go into any of it, but you see data is almost everywhere. We, um, prior to this moment, talked about that everything is digital now, right? You can get almost everything in a way that can be used by a computer to create something new. So I think that's something definitely to look out for. So basically the possibilities are infinite, and if I had more time, I would go a bit more into how you can actually apply this creative strategy in a way that actually allows you to build new stuff, and Tim is gonna build up on this um, a little bit, just because I'm running out of time on this, but um, we have given more thought to how you can actually deal with this limited stream of, of possibilities in, the, in your everyday creative endeavors. But I have nine minutes left to just show you some stuff because I've only been showing you text so far and like a book cover. So what I really want to do is really show you three examples of how I've applied that in the real world with projects and um, then we'll see what you think of it. One last thing, I just want to come back to why it matters to you once more. There is really a rather vacant space still in this field. It's rather new and we talked about it being something where still a lot of pioneering work is being done. So there are studios out there who um, use generative design on a daily commercial basis, but still it's something where you can actually contribute in a way that's um, still really going to be heard. And where I see just doing it for one year now professionally, where amazing agencies have contacted me and people that um, want to work with me, which I probably could not have achieved just being a designer, right? No offense to anyone in any way, just it's so few people really out there doing this kind of stuff that it's amazing to see what opportunities are there. So take that into consideration. So without further ado, I'm going to show you one case I created with um, branding agency uh, Lander Hamburg. It was entered into the this, this year's um, Can Lion 2018. I've actually made a finalist spot, which is anywhere between the fourth and seventh place of 2,000 entries, so that was rather cool for me, being just new into that, seeing the con lion on, on something. A sound there. There should be sound.
Everybody still awake? Cool. <laughs> There's also more music, but it's okay. You can turn off the, the, the sound, it's not, no problem. Um, I said I was not gonna dance, so I'm not gonna do it. Okay, anyway, um, so that's Brute. Um, it is a project where we take data from um, like a vineyard in Hamburg, which is not really well known to produce the finest of uh, wines, um, but I hope they will uh, in the future. And the idea was really to um, let the let the wine, the vineyard itself, really take center stage in that case, because you know it's going to be hard to. Uh, really compete with all these cool wine brands who say, you know, we have the most sunshine and the beautiful, most beautiful places. So we turned that into something where he said, wine is such a sensual experience. It's, it's grown over the course of a year. And, you know, however the weather is going to be, is, is going to make this product um, something unique. So let's show that in a way. Let's, let's do that where someone really can look at it and really see, you know, were there heavy winds? You know, was there like strong wind and rain? Was it warm or not? So what, what shaped that? So it's... Um, something where really the data, so the data of the product, the product itself becomes the essence of the packaging. And um, actually there's on these uh, labels, there's actually the real accumulated weather data of, of each um, year printed on top of it. Um, but what also really is interesting that is that we built like a live online 3D experience. I'm going to show you in a second where you can just look at, you know, how does it look in this moment um, at the vineyard? So what the weather is actually happening right there and how is that driving the system? You can explore it in 3D. And that is something really amazing with that I'm really working towards a lot. We use this not just as a user-facing like experience, but as something that was really the design software for the entire process. Basically, um, I created a unique software for these guys where you can just play with any parameter and really come up with print projects and print products and you can actually hit a button and it outputs it at any possible resolution you can think of in any version and permutation you can think of to really create like advertisement material in the real world as well as videos as well as everything else. And what we did, we combined it with a fun way with, with these really cool um, little um, word plays and, and put it on top of it so that you could actually share it on social media. I'm going to show you another project where that might make even more sense, but it's still what I'm sh showing you here is that we create something that is for the user, it is for the designer, it is for the social media department, and it is something where we ourselves can actually explore what's happening. So let me just do a quick demo. I'm running out of time anyway. Um, where I'm actually gonna just, oops, not that one. Anyway, root wine. So it's integrated into website and because it's dark now, I see it's turning to something with a more interesting dark background. And we actually see there's like 16.6 .6 kilometers coming from the west. There's like no rain and there's a temperature of 11 degrees. And you know, you see the design system is kind of like coming out of this wine bottle and I can like zoom in and look at it and uh, zoom out and really see the full picture and it's integrated into a website, somewhat telling like the story of everything. And that's already pretty cool. But what I really want to show you is um, the mode equals Lender, which is the company, just to quickly show you how we actually went about designing this stuff. So what you see here now is the same system in action, but this is how we developed it. So we have like these various parameters over here that you can't read because the resolution is really bad, but it says something like dispersion, turbulence, all kinds of stuff. What it really means is that um, the designers themselves could just really play with the system and, and see like different variations of, you know, how can we work with color? How can we work with size? You know, what happens if I make it run faster or really slow? And just to get a feel for, you know, how, how dynamic the system could be. And the interesting part of this is that what they actually designed was nowhere close to what I initially came up with. So it was an interesting conversation. And you can still, that's really cool, freeze this thing in time and say, okay, that's like the perfect shot. It's probably not. But I want to tweak it slightly so it's still working, right? You zoom in and out and you just press like an export button and... You've got to trust me on this, um, but it's going to actually export like a high resolution file of this thing, right? And I actually did another project where I automated the whole thing, but I'm really running out of time. So basically, um, that's one of the projects where I really applied it. Data. Oops. Here we go. Demo mode always sucks. Weather becomes branding, right? So another one, I'm just going to rush through these, um, is Crazy Cool Developers, which um, takes a different uh, approach on data and people and stories. And it's really, I'm just going to show you the video for now. 
it's like a, it's the idea of can you like create like a brand in some way where actually the data is like the key thing that's driving it again. Where in this case, it's about a group of people on the internet, on Facebook, who communicate and who share ideas about programming and development. And um, if I just quickly restart that again, it makes a lot of sense more. You see like each and every one of these elements is actually one thread in that topic and how big it becomes is actually how much content there is. So how much are people talking about this kind of stuff? And showing you this as a placeholder for a project I'm working on right now, we're actually tapping into a lot more sophisticated data and using AI to drive these decisions. But it still is really essentially um, an example for how you can find something that is not quite a data visualization it's not just a dynamic identity, but it's something that stands for the essence of the project, which I think every identity should in any way. And it's something that you can really explore in 3D space, and you can click around, and you can see it from all these different aspects and facets, um, zoom out. And what it also should do now is, if I scroll down, it becomes something that could even like drive the actual identity in some way. So the background of that become something that could be a key visual for something. Um, and that is constantly evolving. So if you post on that group right now, if this were under video, you know, a new thing would pop up and it would be really small. And over time it would grow and just really visualize the idea of a community that is always growing in some way. Okay, I have 49 seconds. Let's do this. Um, one last project really is Wiki Footwear. Cut me off when I'm over. The basic idea, just as a really quick idea, was that we could take Wikipedia as like a driving source to design our own sneakers. So the world's knowledge literally at your feet. So I hope I'm not getting sued for this, but it just looks cool. Because I'm a big gamer, I'm just going to type in Xbox. And the idea is, it's like just going to collect all this data from Wikipedia, which in my essentially should be Creative Commons, probably isn't. and uses that to actually create a design of a shoe. And you can really explore that and look at it. And this is a beta version still. I'm still working on that. So if anybody of you, you know, works for Adidas or something, hit me up. Anyway, um, so, you know, you can just really look at it and play with it. It works on mobile. There's, like, different styles to it. And uh, you can really play with it and check it out and, like, see it again and imagine some awesome typography on top of this stuff here. But you really see how, you know, I'm, I'm giving up control in some way and where I'm, again, building something. And maybe as a last example, because I'm, oh, my God, as a last thing, again, I'm creating uh, posters from this. You saw the shoe and I typed in something and I can just hit this button again and say, okay, give me, like, unlimited poster variations of this unique shoe. And I can actually at the shoe to the gallery, share it on social media, and somebody could hit up that link and get that same shoe back, right? So it's, again, um, something cool. <laughs> so, again, that's why you guys should care about generative design. Um, I wish I would have had more time, but you're already here. So thank you very much. Um, next time. Okay. Oh, wait, safe? there's questions. Cool. Um, <laughs> I can tell you're all really sad that, you're, that Patrick is already done. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, we have time for some questions. So who has a question, I will throw you a catch box. Uh, and you can ask something to Patrick. Just speak uh, into it. I for, uh, yeah, English. Uh, sorry, I forgot your name. Oh, but oh. Angela. Uh, so Angela, in the beginning, said that... Oh, can actually speak into this. Wow, that's... <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, so Angela said that you've been doing this since you were a kid, but I only heard about this kind of programming maybe five years ago. Um, so yes, yeah, true. Um, I mean, probably my personal history isn't that interesting, but I really started doing this when I was 12. Um, not obviously with this mindset to it, but I started programming. And I think when you ask about that, what I realized, because I've always been programming in some way, but then like picked up the profession of being a designer, is that all these tools have initially or have already been available to us, but what I believe what the new idea of generative design really is, is combining these different fields and mindsets into a new kind of creative strategy that allows you to build stuff with existing tools that create new stories. So basically, yeah, I've been doing that. It made it easier, but there, and, and Tim is teaching that and gonna uh, go to that in a minute. It is something that every one of you can do. I totally believe in you, and um, it's, it's not as complicated as it sounds, so um, it's not something where you have to be like born for this. So I've been doing it all your life, like classical guitar or something. 
Does anyone else have a question? We have time for one more. No? Okay. Don't let me hang in. No, okay, That's cool. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, Patrick, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Patrick is going to be here uh, for the Borrel, so you can talk to him a little bit more. I'm sure he's also very enthusiastic to tell us a little bit more. Sure, if you um, find me a beer, that's cool. Everybody, a big round of applause for Patrick.